Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. Uh, today, we sit with Rakaya Taylor. She's the face, the brand, the name of Ken. Ken stands for Keep It Natural. Today, we're just going to go in an in-depth conversation with her, you know, about what it was like starting off, you know. Rakaya, you got a long list of accolades of things you did in the industry. We're not going to go over them all right now, but we'll hit all of them during the length of the interview. But just starting off, let's just start off. Starting off, what was it like? How did you get into the business of being a hairstylist? I don't know what you label yourself as, so I'm just going to go with hairstylist and then you can, you know, educate us more on what, what you consider yourself. But how did you get started and what got you into this industry or what made you go in this direction? Um, my foundation started with my mom. My mom was a hairstylist. My mom was a natural hair braider. So growing up, um, I helped my mom braid. Um, when I first started my career, I started off with my classmates, my teachers, um, and like middle school, believe it or not. And when I got to high school, I literally, I had a full blown clientele. So I started off with just like the real passion of hair, like at home with my mom, with baby dolls. And that's where it all came from to really know, like, that's all I've ever wanted to do. Wow. That's, that's pretty cool. So, so then you're doing this, so now you got your classmates and then. So when did you realize that it was going to be a moneymaker? Because now you're like, okay, so now we're, you know, I'm doing classmates. I'm, I'm you building your book at a young age, you know, especially people, you know, in middle school and high school. I'm, you know, I'm looking, you know, chasing girls, trying to look up under skirts and things. <laughs> but, you know, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing in middle school and high school. I'm just saying me. But what okay. makes you be like, okay, all right, you know, I love doing this and I can make money on this. I The clients kind of reassured me. I would literally do my girlfriend's um, hair at like break or PE. And next thing you know, they're coming over for the weekend and their mom wants their hair done and their sisters want their hair done. So my mom is like, are they want you to do the hair? I was like, yeah, they want me to braid their hair. They, I would literally, I was shampoo pressed doing everything. So it, it was really the customers, the people who actually made me realize that I had a skill level. Um, that's really where it started. I, I wanted to be chased by the boys. I wanted to do all of that, but I literally at an early age had the demand. It started early. Oh, that's great. Oh mm -hmm. no, that's that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So so we 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 going through there. So for people that don't know, where did you grow up at? So I don't want people to think like, oh yeah, in Beverly Hills that'll work. So where did you grow up at? I am from Compton, California. That's Southern California who people they're not aware of. that's Southern California. And um Born and raised, proud, all that. Uh, my favorite show out there was uh, South Central. I don't think Alex is old enough to know that movie, but that's you know, who produced, you know? <laughs> no, yeah. but that was my, that was know, my favorite show. I don't think I've ever seen it. I don't think I've ever seen the show, South Central. Oh, but no, you, know, you can't. You can't, you honestly, can't say you can count it without seeing I got that. You got to watch that tonight. I'm going I'm to go and figure <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go and find it. It's on YouTube, got to be. But yeah, definitely. Gotta, um, gotta, being from Compton, actually was a situation where that was the easiest thing to do. You know, when you were outside hanging out, you could jump rope, you can hang out, you can do your homegirl's hair. So we sat on the porch and we sat on the curb and we did each other's hair. Um, and also I come from a family of predominantly women. So um, a lot, most of my aunties were single parents. My mom was a single parent. And I have three sisters that don't have any brothers. I didn't grow up with a dad at home. So I kind of picked up where my mom fell short. She was with clients all day, and I was making sure my sisters were right. Older, and I'm a middle child, by the way, and we're all eight years apart. So my older sister, who's eight years apart, I'm taking care of her hair. My baby sister, who's younger, I'm taking care of her hair. And my mom. I even did my mom's hair. So early on, like, definitely, um, y'all making, y'all throwing some memories back for me, asking me these questions. So, yeah, it, that's a big, yeah, it's been a minute, yo. Alex, you got one? So, yeah. So at what point did you maybe start to like think, OK, so you started to see you actually had a talent, a skill and people started having that interest in you doing their hair and you started to pick up demand. When did you think like, hey, let me start charging them? Or did someone tell you, hey, let them don't let them waste your time. Maybe you should start charging them like about how old were you when that came about? For sure. I had to be about 12 and I was getting about $50 a head and on the weekends and after school, I was about 12 or 13 with $300 cash. Wow. Just from doing hair. Um, and at that time, 
I couldn't value money. I just thought it was really cool to give my mom the money or to, mm. you know, I didn't think about clothes for myself. I didn't think about anything. I was really like, mom, look, I made money here, you know, um, mm -hmm. at that age. So yeah, I knew that I could charge. Um, and once my mom started seeing that I was making that kind of money, oh yeah, she she promoted that. She got me to go. <laughs> let me yeah. know that, that <laughs> you are going to do this. And right. that's what I did. So it definitely became a situation of, okay, this service, I started realizing what I could charge and charge different. Because initially it was like, okay, $20, $30 for everything, no matter what you're getting. Then I started breaking down, this taking me more time. This is causing, you know, costing their supplies and this and that. Um, and I started charging for the supplies, charging for the hair. And I've been doing, I'm 43, so I've been doing hair for a while. And back then, braiding hair was two for $5. That is not the case today. So um, I didn't understand the, the value of profit back then, but I knew to be reimbursed at least. So I was charging people as far as, okay, I'm going to spend $5. I'm going to have waters for them. I'm going to do their hair and it's going to take me three hours. So I'm going to charge them a hundred dollars and they paid it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, and so uh, like, so one of my questions too is like, cause a lot of people, I think when they are getting into say a hobby or something that interests them, like you, you were, you were, st you started doing hair since birth. It seems so like oh, at yeah. what, like, were you ever at a time or was there ever a point where like um, you're doing a bunch of people's hair and it just felt like, man, this is a waste of time. Like, was it you that made the decision to charge them or was it like your mother who said, hey, why don't you start to like make a business out of this? Was it anyone that guided you into starting to be, I guess you could say, profitable off of that? My mom was really a force in making sure that I was getting paid because she saw how much time I was spending doing yeah. it. I vividly remember her being like, what does she pay you? You spend, you know, and I was just like, I'm just <laughs> okay. trying to get up. I'm trying to go to the party because I, at the time, <laughs> I started really getting booked up and it was to the right. point where I was doing my friend's hair and they were leaving my house and going out, but somebody else was coming over to get their hair done. So I was like, look, I don't know what to do. So for my mom, she was like, you have to start charging. And um, I did a lot of free stuff too, though. You know, mm -hmm. there were some people who didn't have money at all and I didn't value profit at the time or money. So I did a lot of hair because I just loved it. But my mom was the one, she did. She was like, you have to charge. And um, I never told her when I didn't, but there was a lot of times I didn't. Yeah. Right, right. I got I got one for you. Um, and, and that, in that situation right there, um, your mom, it seemed like your mom recognized that time is valuable so she saw that she was missing out on all the things that the the people that was in your age range was doing and you was sacrificing your time to you know do what the people in their teenage years was doing to make money so i understand you know your mom was like well she at least should be compensated for sacrificing you know missing the things that everybody else is missing going to the house parties you know especially back in the day around that time because we were around the same age so around that time you know, they had the house parties going on. They had the, you know, the skating rink and they had everything. That's when it was jumping. Now, these kids don't know nothing about no real partying. But <laughs> but back oh, I've then. Been, I've been in the back braiding hair at parties. I've been like, we're taking all this to the party. <laughs> oh, trust me. I, I got receipts on oh. that too. Like, I have been in places <laughs> where we're all supposed to be having fun, but I don't found a client. Because it, it became, that's what we're going to do. We're going to party over here and... I can braid your hair. Just bring me to jail. Bring me to comb. And I would literally find five minutes, find me a spot, throw some braids. And, you know, back then I was doing a lot of male's hair too. So in Compton, right. in California, Los Angeles, men have long hair, typically right. everywhere they now these days. But back then men wore braids. And for the men, it was quicker money and it was quicker services for me because all I had to do was park them and braid them. Whereas girls, it was a shampoo, maybe a press. It was a lot more. So I got into the room of doing a lot of men's hair because I was good at the designs and things like that more so than um, the ladies. So I would be at parties. I would be at kickbacks. We would be at park parties and what we call hood days and things like that. And I'd be braiding hair in the parking lot. Um, it, it was a time. Oh uh, yeah, cool. So, uh, Alex, I know you got a couple in there, but I'm a fast forward it a little bit, and then we can jump back. But um, so fast forward, I'm looking at right now. I'm looking at you know 
the accolades and things that you've done. I mean, I'm not going to name all the names because we're going to be here for about 20 minutes naming everybody. But you've been working in the industry, especially in the media industry. I see you've done projects with BET, Bravo, OWN, VH1, you know, the We Network. Uh, you got some some heavy hitters here on your list of clientele. I mean, Keisha Cole, Detroit native. That's my girl. You know, that was my favorite song. You got K. Michelle. You got Exhibit, you know, Pimp My Rides. You got a lot of people out here. Um, but I'm not going to go through the list. You got uh, Billy uh, Woodford and things like that. Bad Boy, you know, Cash Money, all that. So, you know, you started off, you know, just in your you know neighborhood doing it so what transitioned you to get to that area to be able to get into those rooms that spaces with those kind of people um my initial job i started off with photographers in los angeles so living in los angeles most of my you know job started off with people who were doing things i definitely you know try to create my own lane so I would get with these models and actors and in California, you know, there's a big industry for that. So they're going on callbacks, which is they're getting jobs just to go read for characters. I made them believe at the time that their hair had to match their character so that they can get that job. Um, I also had a friend who worked at the Beverly Hilton and during Grammys weekend, I would literally smock up and walk around the lobby with my business cards and a comb in my hand and introduce myself. Hey guys, I'm Rakaya Taylor. I have a suite on floor 15. If you know anyone, the talent, anybody in the crew or anybody needs anything, hair services for the evening system for this weekend, I'm providing services. And at the time I would never, um, I wouldn't get the talent. I wasn't getting, you know, the Tony Braxton's and the, you know, Michelle Obama's, but I was getting people in their camps. And it became a thing. It was an annual thing for me. And not to mention this month is coming up is February. So February was like, I just knew like, okay, everybody going to be in town for these events. Let me get in here. Um, and I utilize my resources. Um, and after do one person, it leads to another person and then another person. Um, as far as really working with those particular networks, um, I had an agent. And those agents will get me jobs, contracts. So that's how I got into those elements with them. And a lot of the time it was the talent, the actual stars on those shows or those commercials or those networks that would say, hey, I want her to do my hair. Um, I think that's it. I think I answered it. I think so. Did I? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> good. good. Alex, what you got? Yeah, no, so um, I'm glad you brought up social media because I actually had a question about that. Um, do you see a difference with social media as far as, let's say, I know you probably don't have like calculations down, but did you see a spike in business when you started social media, when you started promoting on social media? Um, personally, I think that social media is the best outlet for my services in my industry and for me I've always been that's been my weak spot um, I should be more in tune to social media um, because of the caliber of my clientele I've always been able to have them go on their social media and tag me and I just kind of retag them um, in my personal opinion social media is the way to go for the current but my generation of this industry that wasn't our thing so mm -hmm. this social media thing is something new to my generation for me because I've been doing it for 20 years. So that's actually where I'm leading. Like right now, I need to get into it the way the, the, the current is. Um, it was not the thing to have a comb in your left hand and a phone in your right hand doing hair. I based right. my professionalism on continuity and making sure that people had a service that they could, you know, it was a privacy. These mm -hmm. days, it's a little different. So um yeah. Social media is a game changer. And if I can elevate on that platform, oh, I would win. I would totally win. Social media is just another, I mean, it's like from what, how you did it, you know, going to the actual events, you know, making it happen, putting name to face, the networking, the things that we did before the social media age, before the internet age really became a boom. It's, that's just another, this is just another layer of it. I mean, it's still, you got to go out there and put out the content. You got to put out the content and then you got to drive people. But it's the same thing. But instead of you getting those one-to-one -one faces with, you know, one person as you was doing it before, how we did it historically, you know, 
uh, handshakes and passing out business cards. Now it's just a face to many. So it's just the same hustle, but just doing it in a different avenue. So yeah, Alex, what so you I guess, got? I guess with my generation, I did my thing. You know what I mean? Like I definitely, right. when my generation was doing what we were doing, I was, I was doing that. And that was really just being in the right place at the right time and introducing yourself to mm -hmm. everybody and making sure right. that, you know, when I was with the talent, I kept pictures, you know what I'm saying? But they're not for social media. That's not something that I should be posting on social media, like me in a dressing room with talent, you know, um, mm -hmm. a finished product in my generation, we wait till the movie airs or we wait for the magazine to print or we wait for the show to come out. And I screenshot my, my name in the credits. That was our social media. That was, and look, mom, cause you know, right. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, my mom, she works in the nail industry. So I think she just started using social media. But it was the same thing, like you're saying, is just a lot of her clients, it's just word of mouth and them telling other people and spreading that on their social media. But she has a huge clientele, but it's like, that's just what she's built up over the decades of doing nails. So, well, the first, the next question I'm asking, because, you know, we went to the early life, then we, you know, fast forwarded to that industry. So, well, it's two questions, so I'm going to ask the first one, then I ask the next one. But um, what advice would you give to any any young lady, young male, trying to aspire to get into the hair industry, you know, going through the trials and tribulations and everything you went through from young till now, what would be one piece of advice that you would give them when jumping into the industry as a whole? The advice I would give someone young that's passionate about the hair industry is realize, you know, the shortcuts, you're always going to circle back. There's no shortcuts. There's a whole process of understanding this industry, the customer service, the protocols, the technique, you know, um, just knowing that the steps you need to take are so instrumental to a successful career. And, and don't take any shortcuts. That's, that's a big deal. And, and each individual person that could be a whole, different type of advice for a braider there's hey you gotta know how what, what products are out there whatever so knowing what they specialize in or what they're really really good at use that to get you where you need to be and continue in education i definitely feel like they need to have always be willing to keep learning and always you know understand that nothing's really reinvented or or new nothing's new things are just remixed and take advice be willing to take advice and constructive criticism yeah great i like that i like that so my second question is uh if you can go back in time and you can have one message to young rakaya at 12 years old from rakaya at 43 years old what would you tell her to do differently or what would you tell her what's a piece of advice you would give her if you could travel back in time. I would tell the 12 year old Rakaya to be patient with the process and don't skip steps. And what I mean by that, when I started off in the hair business without a license and without a oh. license, it hinders you. But if I had have gone to school and did that in the right steps, I would be for, I would have been further along at that point. I am a licensed professional now, but I did. I mean, I, I, I skipped steps along the way because I felt like I needed to just be. I wanted the I wanted everything when I wanted it in the way I wanted it. So the young me needed to follow protocol and follow rules and don't skip steps. That's a major part of my career that hindered me a whole lot not having a license. Great. Right. I love it. Love it. Alex. So Kirby had stated that you specialize mostly on black hair. Was there, have it, has it always been black hair or have you, I'm sure you can do all kinds of kinds of hair, but was it, was there a certain point where maybe you transitioned to just specialize mainly on black hair? Um, because my initial like starting out, it was family and friends and they were predominantly black. So yes, um, 
I am more familiar with ethnic hair and I have created such a good rapport with making sure people understand their hair that I do focus on ethnic hair, but I am mm. a multicultural professional. I do all hair, all textures, all type, because hair is just hair for sure. Um, and primarily if you can do ethnic hair, you can do any hair, but if you can't do ethnic hair, you can't do ethnic hair. So for me, that's all I had to practice on when I was doing hair. And that was most of my clientele coming to me. Um, and ethnic hair is a lot of different variations of, of hair. Black people, we have a lot of different textures, types, lengths, densities. So it's a it's a category of its own to have a lot going on with ethnic hair. So it can keep me busy enough to focus on that only, but I like it all. Do you see similarities within, say, the... Um like Latin people and black hair, like is, is their hair similar to those of, um, the, those that are African-American? In some cultures of Latin, you know, um, as far as Mexican, they have a different porosity in, in their hair. It is different, but Dominicans do have more of an Afro texture. You do have Puerto Ricans that do have. So when you look into Latin, that's a big scope. Um, just like in, african-american or african you know we have a lot of big scopes too so there are a lot of similarities and texture the way products are you know receptive to their hair textures the way color and everything is receptive to the hair um i can have one product line and use it on all nationalities but i probably use it a little different per nationality okay i got one i got one and and somebody wanted me to ask you this question um all right, so we're going to see if you're a true professional. I looked on uh, YouTube Shorts or TikTok yesterday, and I saw the man unit where the guy was bald, and then they put a little piece on there, and you they hooked him up. What Can you do anything with what I got going? <laughs> can, you, can you help me out? You know what? I do not specialize in prosthetics. That is the real <laughs> That is the real term for what those services are. Oh, but okay. there is a, there's a new cosmetology license that they're offering right now nationwide. It's called Cosmobarb. And the Cosmobarb are barbers who are now doing cosmetology services, which is the service that you're uh, relating to. Or referring oh, okay, to. so I I got to I gotta do some research. Get that Steve Harvey going or I got, something. That'll be more homework for me. I'm going to go watch South Central. And I'm gonna find you somebody to make you that hair. Okay, two things. I got the homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm gonna come back over here with a high top page, y'all. Watch out, Alex. What you got? Oh my <laughs> oh, out. <laughs> no, it's a, it's interesting the the black hair industry because I uh, I didn't know that there was a niche to the hair industry, like there's specific hairs and all of that. I mean, I know that hair is different. But I noticed or I was reading that the black hair industry, it um, profited nine and a half billion dollars last year. Do you that was what was reported. But do you agree with that number? Can you see that figure to be true? Yeah. In the last 10 years, I can really say that there has been a super like increase in people retailing hair um extensions hair products there's a lot of labs all around the nation that are doing um a service is called private labeling people are able to go into labs formulate anything from shampoos to conditioners leave-in agents um all kind of things and put their name on it and with social media being the way it's elevating everybody and their brands even myself, I'm capable of having extensions for retail, products for retail, and then not a lot, you know, and not to mention my services itself. So it's a great business right now. And um, I encourage a lot of people to get in it with passion though. You know, it's a, it's a business that has become a hustle for a good percentage, almost more percentage of passionate people. So I believe those numbers are factual for sure. One of my questions, and uh, it's probably my most, uh, the biggest question I have for you is how have you seen that this business has changed your family or helped your family, your family that you have now? I believe that my, meet my career, my career mm -hmm. is a huge benefit, you know, to my family because I love what I do. 
that's the first thing. I love what I do. I'm a happy person in my mm -hmm. career. I love the people that I meet. I've, I've traveled my husband active duty Marine Corps, Marine. So in the Marine Corps, I've learned so much about the skill level that I have. Um, I stay afloat around my home because I'm happy in my career and um, doing all the people, you know, all the hair that I've done. People, when they sit in my chair, it becomes a chase lounge. I need a PhD, by the way, for being a cosmetologist. <laughs> you get into people's heads and you learn them. But for me, um, I'm truly passionate with, uh, with what I do. So I can come home at night and talk to my children about who, what hair I've done and like happy about it. So I think it benefits my family because I love what I do. So I come home happy. I come home with good energy, um, especially when clients are all beautiful when they're done and they feel good when they're done and you know we've had a good day so um for me to love what i do it definitely rubs off on my family well yeah um alex sorry i'm gonna cut in there because you can't you brought up a good topic there um and rakaya you just said something that was just special you said that you need a phd in psychology because you you're the you're the person that they come vent to you know i mean the clients they come vent to you they talk to you you're their therapist you're everything you know y'all sit there for you know hours and y'all talking communicating and then when they when they leave your seat they leave a better person they feel better they look beautiful they feel more self-confident about themselves just like leaving a therapist right and then so with that and then I'm asking for, you know, people that want to get in the industry, maybe they're, they didn't start off as, you know, 12 year old, you know, they're up there or older and they think it's too late for them. And, you know, or they always have, they already have a family, you know, you spoke on your husband and your children. So how do you balance that work life of being a mom, being a wife and doing what you're passionate about? I definitely want to clone or three. I am busy, but I wake up and I just get it done. It is definitely intentional to multitask. I am defrosting chicken right now. You know, I have a load of laundry drying right now. I have some hair that's in, that's processing, that's conditioning for a client tomorrow. So after years of doing it, I just know what things need to do. My oldest child is 19. So for 19 years, I've only been a stylist for a little over 20. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like, I've been doing it for a long time and I got into the rhythm of understanding how to have some balance. So I am always multitasking and I have help. I'm a married woman, um, but I've only been here for seven years. So before the seven years, I had my mom. I've never, ever just been, you know, just all by myself. I can always ask for help. And not to mention um, being a salon owner, I had a team. Um, I owned a salon with nine professionals. So I was able to delegate duties in some ways, shapes, or fashions when I needed it. Um, so I put myself in a position to know I needed help, to ask for help, and to do all that I could do to multitask when I needed to. So I'm very good at not overwhelming myself. So um, that was the way that I made everything balance out. Like I am okay with saying, I can't get you in today you know, or I can't do this right now. But that was a learning thing because I can, if we had more time, I could tell you, I was not that person. I'm really talking about the current me, the right now, the this day, this minute. That's what I do. I make sure to get up, make sure dinner's going to be ready, make sure this, you know, so it's, I think it's more so about multitasking to sum it up. Yeah, it's interesting hearing you talk because a lot of what you're saying is stuff that I've heard my mom talk about. And it's the same thing. She currently she works a job and she also does her nails or she works on nails. She's been doing nails for 30 years, but her goal is literally to leave her job so she can work more at the salon. Like she loves it, like you're saying, like it's her passion. And it's uh, it's funny, too, because she's also tells me all the time that she feels like she should be a therapist or that she is a therapist because people are always talking to her about things that you wouldn't talk to the average person about. I mean, they tell so. you everything. <laughs> everything. Yes. I know everything. I know blood types and all that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's like, yeah, she's she's told me some stuff that like, man. But um but no, it, it's it's interesting how someone can be 
that passionate and the hours that they put in does not feel like work and she's a she's a professional at multitasking i can i did not pick up that trait from her but it's a mom it's yeah a mom. <laughs> so yeah so i'm glad you brought it up and then after this question we'll bring your husband in uh and then you could tell me about how life is or what's his perspective of it, you know, from his side, being a, a husband of somebody that's uber successful doing what they do and how he, you know, helps along and what he's doing and things like that. Um, but you brought up the the uh, owning salon in Georgia. So Compton, California, how did you find Georgia out of all places? I, got, I probably got an idea, but I want to hear from you. I was, my 19 year old's father and I bought a home in Georgia in 2007. That's what led me to Georgia. And uh, we moved there because the economics in Los Angeles, you know, it was one of those things where, where could we afford to buy a home? Um, and that was me, you know, just being led in that relationship to say, hey, this is what I think is best for you and my daughter. And I took his lead on understanding that I made that move to understand I was doing something better for me, my daughter, and that relationship at that time. Right. So you you get to Georgia and then what was that aha moment of saying, hey, let me set up a storefront here. And I think it's a good, you know, mix of I can uh, gain margin. I can, you know, take take profit share from other people. Let you know, build my clientele up. How, how would that mindset go? Or how did that mindset go? Excuse me. I opened up Keep It Natural Hair Studio in Georgia because at the time I was only professional and consistent in doing extension services in natural ethnic hair. I was not comfortable with pixie cuts or locks or any of the other cosmetology services. And I had a team of people because I was a contractor stylist working on sets and stuff that I would always refer them to. I was giving so much business that I couldn't take to April Lane, Reba, Japonica, all these young ladies that worked for me for at least nine, 10 years, they worked for me. It's because I had one set of a whole team for that long. And that's really rare in the black hair industry. But I was right. earning so much business that I decided to ask them, let's let me open up a shop and let's work together. And um, because of the caliber of my clientele, I wasn't in a location where I was getting walk-in traffic. Um, my business wasn't established to be a community business for everybody to keep walking in and walking in. I all My stylists were professionals who had clientele, who had a skill level, who just needed a place to work together as a team. Um, so I was a little isolated in the community, a very popular side of town. But that was for the, the privacy of my clientele and the clients that I was referring to them and things like that. So as business grew and you know contracts grew and things changed and everything um the business had you know up and downs and things like that so mm -hmm. for me opening up keeping natural was really because i was referring so much business to these other professionals that i decided to open up a salon so that if i had a customer who needed her hair colored and cut and treat it that I can do this service. You can go over to chair B and do that service. You can go over to chair C to do that service versus three different people coming into their their hotel rooms or into their homes or whatever. Like I was on the road a lot. Um, mm. And it worked in my favor. It was pretty cool. I, I, I profited from my business um, for the most part. And it chewed me up and spit me out, actually. I'm going to be honest. Like it was not easy managing other professionals under my scope of my vision of my professionalism right yeah and i mean me being an entry of course i can't i can't cut hair at all uh but that's what like you said keeping keeping uh, a team together for that long is that's a feat in itself i mean everybody always having ideas and say oh i could do it better some other way i'm gonna go start my own thing this way and keeping it keeping together that long is is very 
it's a very hard task to do. But like you said, it's it, your your standard of professionalism is your standard of customer service. And like uh, I talked to Alex about, and we talk on this channel about even in real estate. Real estate is a customer service business, especially if you're dealing with rental properties. You can't just say, "Oh, I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna buy the property and let's just forget the tenant. They got to pay anyway." You have to build a rapport. They have to have an understanding. They have to know that you're 100 there for them, and there and you and if something comes up, you'll be there to take care of them. It can't be, uh, well, I'm just, you know, I'm the owner. I could just do whatever I want to, and they have to pay me just for doing nothing. So it's it's a level of customer service and a level of professionalism that you got to have in most industries. Um, before we wrap it up and bring your husband in, I want to ask you, because uh, I know people in the Dallas Fort Worth area, if uh, you want your you know, you want your hair did. You, you can't get the man unit like me yet, but we're going to get there. We're going to get it. <laughs> you know? uh, but, but Rakaya, give everybody your handles and how they can get a hold of you. And then, we, and then we're going to post them up on the screen also. But just okay. So the salon suite, I'm at Sola Salon Suites. I'm in suite 32. And that is in the Alliance Plaza in the city of Fort Worth. I am there seven days a week. You can book online. I am on Instagram and Facebook at Rakaya Taylor, my first and last name, and the booking links are in my bio. All right, now we're back with segment two. Now we got Rakaya from Keep It Natural, and then we have her husband, John, and I'm about to start this right off. Get this. Rakaya, you said something good when the camera was off. So tell me tell me that first intro when you met when you met your husband. You know, y'all been married seven years, so tell me, tell me what you said off camera. When I met him seven years ago, he was telling me he was about to retire. I'm at my 20 years. I'm about to throw in my papers. I'm about to retire. And I considered that he was in process of that. But it is seven years later, and he's still active duty. <laughs> they going to have to kick him out, y'all. <laughs> yeah. So, John, what you got to say for yourself? Um, You know, coming from where we came from, um. It just it just it fits me. It was a calling, you know. So I love what I do. So yeah, it's been seven years. I hit twenty seven years in the Marine Corps today. Um I'm a command sergeant major and yeah, been been all over the place. But I love what I do. Yeah. So so I'm taking it uh Georgia. Y'all met in Georgia. I'm taking that, right? Was in Georgia? Yep. Okay, perfect. All right, so so John, she's you meet her. She's a business owner. She's running the business. So just what was life like that with you? You know, now what you know now you have somebody, especially in the military world, it's a lot of traveling, a lot of uh, moving places and things like that. Now you have somebody that's settled in one location. What was that? What was your thought process of of uh, dealing with a well-established businesswoman, especially being in the Marine? Yeah. I, um. You know, I'll, I'll be honest and go out there and um, say it was it was all new to me, right? We, um, I was stationed in Albany, Georgia. Um, she would, her and her salon, she was working up in Atlanta, Georgia. I was up, I came up for a weekend to help a friend out, work a um, job. And um, the job that, that he was working was her job. So <laughs> she had hired him. And he sort of hired me because, you know, of our friendship, or whatever. And um, I came up to help out. And I think we hit it off from the first meeting. So it, it was all new to me. Um, prior relationships, it wasn't a businesswoman um, at all, you know, to her caliber. So I was very impressed with her knowledge, what she was doing on her own, um, how she was running the business, managing life, managing, you know, having two girls at the time. So very impressed with her, her drive and determination. Okay, I saw you raise your eyebrows when he, when he said we hit it off for the first sight. I know you was looking like, who is this, who is this guy trying to brush up on me? <laughs> yeah, we, we have our version of the raising the Um My version. I definitely, um, our mutual friend is a chef and I gave a Mother's Day brunch in my home for my family and close clients and things like that. And it was a beautiful brunch. We had everything, literally, from desserts to main courses to side dishes, everything. And um, 
their best friends and he was helping him. And before the event started or whatever, we definitely had, we conversed, we were talking and everything. Um, by the end of the evening, we ended up following each other on social media and I was the forward one. I definitely was, I told him, I said, somebody taking me out. Like, <laughs> and my birthday was like the next couple of days. So I was, yeah. um, there was a lot going on personally at that time. And I think I just wanted company. Never would have thought I was gaining a husband. Never, never, never. Right. So, I so, know. so, John. So, she jumped in your DMs, huh? Yeah, you know that's that's. <laughs> way to be you know. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> no, I um, I definitely found her very um, I was very intrigued by by her and how uh, much of a businesswoman she was. Right. She she had her home was beautiful and all of these. Um, women was there and she was she was throwing it on you know she was taking care of her employees so all of her stylists was there she, um, their mothers were there um her her mother her uh grandmother like um every everyone was there um it was very much so family oriented whatever but it was her giving back to her um to her workers you know or or friends really like, like it, it was a it was a a ran business very organized and everything but um they was it was a family there so very intriguing in that so um during the course of the evening I, I continued to take care of her and she was running around taking care of everybody else and making sure everybody was um you know taken care of I focused on her like I wanted to make sure that she was good so and, and she's seen that yeah. and the type of person that I was yeah and yeah, she she just had to jump in my DMs. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, then she jumped in DMs. That there you go, there you go. All right, so um, now transitioning. So now next thing you know, you know y'all meet up. Now we gonna jump to y'all being married. So now Rakai, you're you're married to somebody that's in the Marines. You know that the where you met him at and where your business established at. You know that's probably not. Even though he said he was retiring in five months. Uh, that that's probably not going to be the last place you stay. Um, how what was that mindset for you as a businesswoman? Um, just a little background on things. When I met Jay, I was selling one of my properties, and I was in seventy percent of closing down my business. So I was closer to knowing that the next chapter of my life did not include having a staff that I ran and the business that I ran and things like that. So. Mentally, I was super attached to my business and to the professionals that worked for me. I think I was more so at the time, a little afraid of shutting down my business, which would have benefited me, my children, my mother the most. I didn't want to let my staff down. So when I met Jay, he came in at a time where I really was ready for a change. And I didn't really know really what that change was. I just knew having this business was chewing me up and spitting me out. It was hard on me. It was, it was, it was weighing on me to where I just knew it wasn't for me anymore. And I ran my business with my heart. I did not run it with a business mind. So when I met Jay, um, he was a breath of fresh air because I really, I was just ready for something different. I wasn't dating at the time. I wasn't in anything serious. Um, I don't even think I really was looking for anything. I just knew career-wise. I wanted to stay in the hair business. There's nothing I'd rather do, but I knew I didn't need that business anymore. So um, as far as him coming in, I think I lost my train of con the question. Do you mind reiterating the question? Because I had to give that background. Yeah, sure. No, I got you. I got you. So when, when you know, he'd been in the military and then he, I'm going to say lied, but, uh, <laughs> but when he said he was going to retire and then you knew you was going to have to uproot from there with him staying in, you know, what was that? you know, mindset like of knowing that, hey, the business is changing. I'm going to have to go somewhere else. If I'm, you know, choose to stay married to him, I'm going to have to go somewhere else to make this thing happen. Okay. So with that little bit of background, I was 70% ready for change. I had never been in a relationship where I was truly led by anyone, really truly led by anyone. And we got married and I still didn't let go of my business. I traveled from North Carolina to Georgia almost weekly to my business by plane, by car. And that was all because I was so attached. And I definitely felt like 
when he asked me to move to North Carolina, I had, I was 50-50. I said, well, no, nope, I'm going to come there when I come there and I'm going to be back in Georgia when I'm in Georgia. But then when he got orders to Japan, we both made a decision to, to shut down Keep It Natural and take a leap on faith where my career could end up. So um, I did. I took a leap on faith and I really just kind of felt like, take my hand, lead me. And that's where I am currently, just really understanding that um, I work well with Jay and understanding how I can do things. Um, I wish I had met him 20 years ago. So the business, the business would probably still be thriving. It would be better um, it, if I knew what I was doing because he wouldn't let me run it with my heart so much. He would have had the business mind and I would have had the little heart in it. But um, him coming along made a difference for the better. Long, like long story short. Yeah, so to tie in the North Carolina piece, so, um, you know, in, in the military, you sort of get orders every three years. So um, I was there for that year where where we dated, and then I got orders to North Carolina. Um, we got married, and, you know, like she said, she ran, continued to run the business. I believed in the business. I believed in her. Um, I didn't want her to shut it down. So she had told me her thoughts about closing it down or trying something um, new. And um, I know she wants to teach and stuff like that. And I was like, the business is good. You got to, you know, um, I won't say it's, it's great to have heart in the game, but it got to, you know, you got to have heart in it for you too. So don't lead it with your just your heart. Leave it with um, the, um, the business aspect of it as well. So she, she continued to run it and yeah when when north carolina came she ended up coming over there working there and then yeah that transitioned to japan so john you said that it was intriguing um seeing how she was managing her business and everything someone like you with the rank that you hold in the marine corps was it admiring for you to see a woman that was able to manage her business the way that she was impressive absolutely there's no, there's no other um, way to put it. Um, the things where I think that, and I think it's important in any relationship to best compliment the person that, you, that you're with. And um, the fact that I think that I, I was um, more, not on the heart side, I guess, you know, more on the firm firm side. Um, I was very impressed with what she, what she did, what she had, how she was doing it, how she was doing it all by herself. And I was, I said the same thing, like, wow, you know what? you know we're we are pair now we'll we'll do this together and we'll take this to next level to the next level to the next level so yeah i was i was yes i was very impressed on um how she did it when you know the structure of how she did it and how she got to where she was at that point even um you know when i learned her story of not having a license and the drive that it took to get to where she was like um, I'm not sure how far you know back she went with it, but from being on music tours with um, a lot of the celebrities from I think the Up and Smoke Up and Smoke Smoke tour with, with Dr. Dre Dr. and Dre, Snoop Dogg and Nocturno and Eminem. It was the Up and Smoke tour. What was that? 2000. And she one or two. She did it all herself. Mm -hmm. You know, going going to those hotel suites and stuff like that, and. I, I was looking for someone like that in my life. And she she compliments me. She takes care of me, um, our home, our business as well. So um I then I think I compliment her as well as keeping things in 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 intact and in uh, on the right track to lead things as a business and not just with the heart. And so Rakaya, for you, I have a question. Um you guys have done a lot of traveling, obviously, especially to Japan. Have you been able to maybe specialize in what you do, being able to travel to different countries and serve different people, different ethnicities and things of that sort? Absolutely. Um, being in Japan brought on a new caliber of understanding. There's a lot of hair regulations in the military. And I took you know, he to understand what those requirements and regulations were. And I think I was really focused on bringing more femininity to the actual Marines and sailors that I had access to. 
And I really implemented making sure that they knew how to transition from active duty to feminine on the days that they didn't have to be in military attire and things like that. I really went through explaining a lot of these young girls had only had their mother as their stylist. And now they're all the way in Japan with a professional oh. and knows how to really get into their hair. So I did a lot of teaching, not to mention everyone who sits in my chair is a student, period. And all those young ladies, they have the military standpoint on the forefront of their lives. So when they sat down in the chair, I had to really bring them back to the femininity and understanding that you're still a woman and your hair is a lot of confidence. Um, so me knowing what the military requires of their active duty, I would really show them like how products work for your texture, how tools work for your texture, how to maintain this really nice polished look. And then on Friday night, we're gonna turn up. We're gonna let it down and we're gonna let it breathe. So, um, I had a cool little name for myself like out there. I really did. I had the opportunity of, you know, talking to um, the Commandant and Marine Corps. Yes. Um, so. I definitely had a substantial amount of his time conversing with him about hair in the, in the military. And just that little area for Iwakuni, Japan, I feel that the people that I touch, I think I changed their perspective of how to be an active duty military personnel and a real woman, you know, not not the not real women, but how to be feminine outside. Because it's just, unfortunately, it's not the most feminine approach when you're in, when you're active duty, it's not. Right, right. Um, so yeah, as far as meeting with the commandant, I told him, I said, you know, there's a lot of things happening with hair care that needs to change and hair requirements that needs to change. I think he would have more productive women doing, being better active duty if they felt better about themselves. And that's a long story, so. I understand that. Um, so before before I transition all the way to Japan, I know, Alex, you went there. Going back to the business in Georgia, besides the fact of, you know, the, you know, the move, you know, now, now you're married to a Marine. Boo. But um, <laughs> now you're married to a Marine. Um, so what aspects of the business, you say it because you was already at 70% in the uh, process of shutting it down. So what aspects of the business? First, I'm going to ask Rakaya that you didn't like about the business that made you want to shut it down. And then Jay, what was uh, some of the aspects of, about the business that you didn't like that, you know, confirmed her uh, intuition to shut it down? Rakaya first. Um, my decision and wanting to shut it down was because, you know, guys, I never really ran my business like a business. I had professionals that I loved my staff and I worked with them in the same building and we turned on the same light and we used the same shampoo bowls and things like that. I never ran my business as a business. I tried to make everybody feel like an independent owner in one establishment. I never wanted to make them feel like they worked for me. And unfortunately, as good as I felt doing that part, it just wasn't a real business. And I, and it was starting to weigh on me because I didn't have, I didn't have it in me to say, hey guys, I want this done like this. I see how other businesses are doing that. Let me do that. Um, I was nervous of my staff wanting to be their own boss. So I tried to make sure that they all felt like a boss. And at the end of the day, that's not how you run a business, not in this industry. So I needed to shut it down just to understand I'm not really benefiting from this business. I'm working with people that I love. And that's what I did for, what, 13 years? I had that shop. I literally worked with people that I loved. And they paid their booth rent, most of them. And when they didn't pay their booth rent, I never had any, you know, there was a lot going on in my business that I just, I, I, I did it with my heart, every aspect of it. Um, and where they fell short, I picked up a hundred percent and I kind of was worn out, but I never spoke on it. I just kind of knew that it wasn't nobody's fault but my own. And I didn't want to have a business on that caliber. So I knew it was time. John, what's your insight on it? Um, yeah, I, I seen everything that she said. Um, it was just like that, uh, where some of the pieces would fall short. She would just pick it up, 
you know, and um, as he was trans, we was transitioning to now um, want to have a family and build um, financial, you know, gain and success. And um, you can't, you can't, you can't lead with your heart first, in my opinion, to get there the way that, you know, it's being done. Um, it's okay to have a heart and it's okay to care and it's okay to love. But because you run it like a business don't mean that you don't care or you don't love, you know, you have to um, be able to look out for yourself so you can look out for the other uh, people. So her idea to shut Absolutely. it down, um, I was, you know, I think supportive of it, you know, so, um, but I, I really believed it. Um, so much to the point of, uh, I think, you, you know, I've, I, I've always sort of aspired to be a um, JROTC instructor when I got out of the military because at the time I was volunteering and I was helping in the community and stuff like that. So I wanted to probably go into a school and just help educate the, um, the youth, you know. So when we got together, I won't say that that changed. But the way she ran the business and how much heart she had into it helped me honestly change my career path on where I wanted to go. So I stayed in a little bit longer, uh, well, seven years or more, whatever. But um, <laughs> but um, I, I believe in it so much to where this is what I want to do when I get out, just to continue to support her and her dreams the way that she supported me and mine um, over the course of the years. So, yeah. I mean, I supported it, but I, I believed in it too. And she kept it longer. I was like, "Hey, no, let like look, let me let me um, help or give some advice in some of these areas, and let's let's see what it can do, you know." And um, mm -hmm. you know, the military being the military, when they gave those orders, transition, you know, we, we had a decision to make. So, which I think end up helping helping out a great deal. You know, so. Honestly, you know, remember the plaza got bought. And they were going back and we were it was time to renew the lease so we had an issue jay really and my staff jay and my staff made me really realize that it was a savable situation the salon could have been a real good profitable and you know thing for myself and jay now the when it was time to renew the lease there were some things going on in the business electrically and the the plaza was very old you know it was created in the 80s we were having some issues of deterioration and things like that and when it was time to renew the lease, what they needed and what we needed didn't really match up. And it just yeah. happened to have peak of COVID. So we decided to just shut it down because we couldn't come to an agreement on what we needed to renew. And they couldn't make changes to, to you know, for me. So um, me and the owner of that plaza, um, we talked still. We're, we're still in good hands. It's, it's, it, it wasn't any ill will. It's just we knew it wasn't something that I should have done. But my staff and Jay, they believed in me and we... He turned it around for me maybe the last year and a half. It was doing better. My staff was doing what they're supposed to do. Um, we had decorated a little bit. So it was going up. But when it was time to renew, we knew my shampoo bowls needed to have different plumbing. Um, we had a issue with um, just some uh, extermination issues and stuff like that. We were having some stuff. So it was that thing that we decided, you know what? We gonna take a leap on faith and go take this international location for three years. We had financial goals to reach. We had we had all kind of things that we were gonna do in three years to take this break. Mm -hmm. And I, and and that's what it, it just panned out at the same time. But that's how you know Rakaya means the fortunate one. That's what my name means. It's Swahili, and it means the fortunate one. Like things just happen like this for me. It just it just happens all the time. It just lines up and it adds up. Mm -hmm. So last question that I have for you guys would be, what is the end goal or what are you guys working towards right now in your lives with where you are today? Mm, personally, for me, I aspire to teach. I would like to, um, I'm in the state of Texas and here in the state of Texas, um, the high schools offer an academy of cosmetology. I think that's what I want to do. And I'm actually drinking from a cup that a friend gave me i don't know if you guys can read it but it says the one who the one where rakaya becomes a cosmetology instructor i'm not sure if y'all can see that mm -hmm. okay. I, it has been 
years of people telling me you are ordained to teach you should teach people who have just met me here in texas you should be teaching um i know a lot about hair care i know a lot about this industry um that's what i think i'm gonna end up doing for sure and our 10 year old wants to be a cosmetologist so okay. i have a whole empire to create for her so between raising a cosmetologist like my mom raised me and teaching other professionals my way of cosmetology is kind of where I know that's next. Okay. Yeah. So I would say um, supporting her in, in that dream. Um, I've done my um, my t my time. I think that you know retirement is is um, on on the coming, and um, <laughs> I, I, I want to see her dreams come true because there's nothing that she wouldn't um, do for me. I want to ensure that I support her in all those endeavors. You know, she, again, left and put things on a, I won't say the back burner, but I would say took the leap on faith. Um, it, it, it was a lot to be able to close down that salon and start over from zero in North, in North Carolina. And then I get selected for a star major and then to stop what she just grew in, in North Carolina and moved to Japan. So I think that though did add a, um, a title to her name. She, uh, she's now an international um, stylist and that yeah, was very sought after, believe it or not. I, and I can't, I can't believe it. And she, she appreciates every one of her clients, but they fly here from different locations of all around the world to, to, get her services wow. this is unbelievable sometimes to really think yeah. like wait a minute you spend and again you know it's because once you sit in her chair it's like it's, it's over from there she's building something that i don't think that people continue to um have as a cosmetology um teacher she still has the the passion for it, the open salon setting versus the suite, the the knowledge. And, and I don't knock the fact that she she did it from her heart, right? It's just that we have to now pair it with uh, financial gain as well because um, right. it's it's not a full one k in um, in you know, hair, hairstyle, you know, you can only do that mm. for, so, for so long, but she teaches everyone who's just in, in her, in their chair and in her chair, um, highly sought after by the combat force, our general at Marine Corps. He came, grabbed her by the hand and poured her to a side, side room. Cause I, I'm not sure if you, you gentlemen know, but just a couple of years ago, the military was really going through, um, a, a very, hard time with ethnic hair and just hair in the military in itself. Those right. bonds that they've been doing for years were making um, patches in the back of women, women's hair, pulling that so tight. And I, I tell you, I've learned so much from her just watching her do this. He pulled it aside and said, teach me what I don't know. Where do I need to go? What do I need to make happen to, to, make, to make sure our female service members have what they need. Teach me about these regulations. And it was, I was in so awe, you know, about, about it. And she was, she's teaching the four-star general. You know what I'm saying? So she can, she humbles, I won't say, I don't know if, the, if I'm saying it the right way, but she talks down to, to not down to, but she's at, she teaches at the level of children to high executive people that advises the president of the United States. And every person in between gets the exact same thing, exact same knowledge. So, I mean, I, I believe in her and the plan is to take this thing to the next level and um, help her help her get into the places where she needs to be to instruct the next generation of dollars and continue to um, educate people on what they don't know about um, health, I mean, not healthcare, but um, um, hair care. She that's that's what right. her change is is um was it changing changing hair knowledge hair care hair, hair, hair growth yeah. that's my mission.
Yeah, her, her, her knowledge, her care, her growth, and you know, um, I had a slogan at the time: changing, changing lives one hair. Yeah, that's what I was. Um, changing I changing lives, lives one hand at a, one hairstyle at a time. And that's what you do. And and we always talk about on this channel the cheat code to success is uh, a spouse that's one hundred percent supportive. I mean, my wife, you know, Alex's wife. Uh, we wouldn't be where we're at without them. I can't sit here. I ain't gonna lie. I'd be. I'd probably be somewhere homeless right now if it weren't for my wife. So I just. That's just honest truth. I always had the hustle in me, but I never had the the direction of doing it. Um, so having a supportive spouse, no matter if it's man supporting woman, woman supporting man, or whatever, that that camaraderie that that building block is 100% key because it allows one person to focus on the goal. Like y'all said in y'all situation, you was focusing on the hair care part of it. John came in and worked on the business aspect of it. Like it's like he said, it's so good. It's good to have a passion about something, but it has to meet up with the, the financial realm of making it what's better for the whole and the whole is the family. So that's, that's a good mantra to go with. So we wrap it up here, but we're going to do this again because I got like a million more questions, but I don't want to keep long. I know everybody got other engagements out there, but we're going to do this again because I know people going to be like, wait, what the heck? I got this question. I got this question. But yeah, but Rakaia, work on that. Getting that hair piece for me, please, because uh, I need it. You know, I'm tired of walking around bald. I've been like this since I was like 20. So I need to, I need to, uh, <laughs> I need to get my life together. But All thank right, y'all for you. joining us. And uh We'll see y'all again soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you guys.